Welcome and good morning. Although we cannot be together in the same room due to the restrictions placed upon us, we can gather our hearts together in various places to worship the Lord and to call upon Him. And He looks down upon us. He knows the trying times that we are having, and He is merciful and gracious to us. Let me begin with a few announcements this morning. First of all, Due to these continuing restrictions and the governor's order, we do not have our normal activities taking place. There will be no men's breakfast, no regular prayer meeting, and most significantly, we will not be having the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. This would be the normal Sunday where we would do that. The session thought it was wise to postpone that until we can be together again at a future date. I would mention that on Wednesday evening, I am putting up a theology class on our YouTube channel. If you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, you might want to go and listen. And if you need a copy of the workbook, uh, just let me know and I can send that to you. Uh, I can send you a link to that. As I've been saying all along, if you have any pastoral or diaconal needs, please let us know that. We want to be available to help you. And if we can minister to you somehow, please give us the opportunity to do so. This evening's service will be on YouTube at 5 p.m. Dr. Wingard is going to again preach for us. He's going to be preaching on Psalm 30. So you'll please want to tune in for that as well. If you are able, would you please stand with me for our call to worship, which is in the bulletin. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. Let us turn to Psalter hymnal, Psalm 92b, it is good to sing thy praises. Would you now pray with me, please? Father, we come to you today worshiping and adoring you, for you are a great and glorious God. You have done all things well. You are wise and true. You are faithful and good. 
you show grace and mercy in great abundance to your people. And Father, as we meet for worship this day, we pray that your face would shine upon us, that you would draw us near to yourself, even though we need to be far apart from each other today. We pray that your spirit would work through these means to cause us to rejoice in you, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and to love you with heart, soul, strength, and mind. So, Lord, be pleased with your people and bless your people wherever they are this day. And, Lord, we lift our voice together and pray as our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We have decided that it would be best not to use responsive readings, but rather to work through some of our creeds. And so this morning we are using the Apostles' Creed. I have sent you a copy of that on the email. And if you have a hymnal, you can turn in your hymnal. It's in the Trinity Hymnal on page 845. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This great, loving, caring God whom we serve, who cares so much for us, calls us now to confession through the words of Psalm 92. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man has no knowledge, nor does a stupid man understand this, that when the wicked sprouted up like grass, and all who did iniquity flourished, it was only that they might be destroyed forevermore. But you, O Lord, are on high forever. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies will perish, and all who do iniquity will be scattered. God is very gracious towards his children, but he is very fierce towards his enemies. They will be scattered and they will perish. And so we do not want to be on the side of God's enemies. We do not want to line up against him. That would be dangerous and it would be foolish. And so when we find ourselves on the wrong side, when we have sided with God's enemies and done those things which are displeasing to God, that should frighten us. And it should drive us to go to him to confess our sin, and to seek his forgiveness. 
Now, in helping us to do this, he gives us his commands, his laws, throughout Scripture. And those commands help us to evaluate our lives. This morning, we're reading in the law from Deuteronomy chapter 20, reading from verse 10 through verse 15. When you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. If it agrees to make peace with you and opens to you, then all the people who are found in it shall become your forced labor and shall serve you. However, if it does not make peace with you, but makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God gives it into your hand, you shall strike all the men in it with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the children and the animals and all that is in it, in the city, it, all its spoil, you shall take as booty for yourself, and you shall use the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you, which are not of the cities of these nations nearby. As the people of Israel were preparing to go into the land of Canaan and to take their inheritance from the Canaanite nations, God told them that they were to offer terms of peace to any city that they would fight against. And this is particularly and especially cities far away. They would go to that city to make war, but they would offer it terms of peace. And if that city were to accept the terms and open their gates and welcome the Israelites, then the Israelites were to allow those people to live. Now they would be servants and they would be forced labor for the Hebrews but they would be allowed to live. If the city did not accept those terms of peace, then that city would be fought against, besieged, and destroyed. Now, in this provision for the Israelite nation back in those days of the conquest of Canaan, we see a definite emphasis on mercy that the people of God are to be a merciful people. They are not to just go in and destroy willy-nilly. They are not to be duplicitous, to offer peace and then to destroy those who surrender. No, they were to be people of integrity who were people who expressed and demonstrated mercy and peace towards others. And here is the abiding lesson for Christians today. We are to be peaceful people. We are to be men and women, boys and girls, who show mercy towards others. We should not be merciless and harsh and cruel as so many around us are. But we are to have a very different attitude about ourselves. We are to be a peaceful, merciful people. So how do you treat your neighbors, your acquaintances, your co-workers, those whom you encounter in the community? How do you treat them? Are you showing mercy and are you being a peacemaker? Or instead, do you show a harsh, cruel, selfish, vindictive sort of attitude? In our particular time with the COVID-19 crisis ongoing, there's a lot of selfishness that is running rampant through our culture. People are looking out for number one and they are not willing to serve and help others. They want to protect themselves even if that means shutting out or even hurting someone else. And we as Christians need to be very different In these days, are we showing mercy, the mercy of God towards those around us? Let's go to the Lord in a time of silent confession.
O Lord our God, you have been so merciful, so good, and so kind to us. We do not deserve the goodness you have lavished upon us. And yet we know, Lord, that you are like that. You are a God who delights to show kindness and love towards undeserving creatures. And Lord, as we have experienced your goodness and known your kindness, as we have been the recipients of your mercy, forgive us for not being merciful, kind, and good to others. Forgive us for selfishness and sinfulness, a desire to cling to ourselves and to protect ourselves, to advance our own personal interests, even at the harm and hurt of others. Father, forgive us for behaving so much like our culture and so little like our Savior. Lord, for all of our sins, for all the ways we have fallen short of your glory, we plead your forgiveness, your love, and your mercy. Help us and heal us, strengthen and cleanse us. Give us the courage and the grace to live faithfully before you and before all men. Hear us, Lord, for we ask in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord who hears our prayers extends his grace and mercy to us with these words of assurance from Psalm 92. But you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil, and my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous man will flourish like the palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age. They shall be full of sap and very green. To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Indeed, our God is our rock, our fortress. There's no unrighteousness in him. He shows such forgiving love and mercy towards his people that we are refreshed and renewed, that we are enabled to flourish in the courts of our God. And so even in old age, we will be flourishing like palm trees planted in the courts of of the Lord, in the house of the Lord. God forgives us. God cleanses us. God strengthens and sustains us. And for this, we can and we must praise him. This is where worship wells up in our hearts so that we can give honor and glory to him for his saving love and mercy to us in Christ Jesus. So now, let's respond to his grace by turning to an old favorite in our Psalter hymnal, hymn number 456, Jesus, What a Friend for Sinners.
Now, as we turn to the throne of God's grace, we are reminded of those all around us, some who are suffering, and some who have been diagnosed with this COVID virus. This became very personal to me this week as a high school friend from years ago announced on Facebook that she had been diagnosed for the virus and was in quarantine and would not be able to just be out and about doing her normal things. And so we need to pray for those around our country and around our world who are facing this crisis in a very personal way, where they themselves have this disease. We also need to be remembering the caregivers, doctors, nurses, hospital staff, sometimes people who are just worked to a frazzle by the heavy crush. We must pray for our leaders who are trying to navigate through these very uncertain times and especially for our president and his task force. Let us go together to the throne of God's grace. Let us pray. Father, in such uncertain and difficult times, we are so thankful that we can come to you, a God who hears and answers our prayers. We know that you do not turn a deaf ear to your people, but that as we cry out to you, you look with mercy and tender compassion upon us. You know that we are frail. We are creatures of dust. And yet you are the great upholder that sustains and lifts us up and carries us through. And so we bring to you today, Lord, the difficulties of this hour of human history. Lord, this is no surprise to you. You have ordained these things to be from before the foundation of the world. And yet as they have come upon us, they have hit many people very hard. Lord, people around the world are sick and dying of this disease. Many are in hospitals that are overcrowded. We think particularly of Italy and China, and South Korea, and Lord, even in our own country, in Seattle, and in New York City, and in other large metropolitan areas where this virus is running rampant. Father, we do pray for those who have been diagnosed and who are dealing with the symptoms of this sickness. I pray, pray for my friend Margie, that you would be near to her, Lord, and that you would heal her from this sickness. Be with her husband as he cares for her and as he tries to help her. Lord, we pray that he would not also be infected. Father, we pray for those medical professionals, doctors and nurses and hospital staff who are dealing with these difficulties. And Lord, many of them are very tired. Many of them are overworked. And we pray that you would give them times of refreshment. Help them, Lord, in the midst of a medical emergency. Give them strength and give them wisdom. We pray, too, that the resources would be available, the masks and the various items for personal protection. And, Lord, we pray for the uh, development of a vaccine for this particular virus and for those who are working on the research uh, angle of this particular uh, pandemic. Father, we pray for our leaders. We lift up to you our governor, and we pray, Lord, that you would give him wisdom, give the legislature wisdom as well as they seek to work with him. And Father, we pray that the order that is uh, on us now would not last uh, very long, but that you would give the governor and his counselors wisdom as to when to best lift this order. Father, we pray for our president who has been under enormous strain. And Father, we thank you for the wisdom that he has had in leading uh, his team through this particular issue. We pray, Lord, for the various voices who are part of that team. We pray for Vice President Pence as he provides leadership there. And we ask, Lord, that they would have a prudent policy 
for our nation, both in terms of the health issues, but also in terms of the economic issues. And Father, we pray that you would help our leaders in Congress to be working cooperatively with our president, that there might be a sense of unity in our nation against this particular difficulty. Father, we pray for your church as it is impacted by this, as many congregations are not meeting today for worship as they normally would. And Father, that sense of displacement unsettles us and we long to be together in each other's presence, singing your praises, hearing your word together, praying together as congregations. And yet, Lord, we are not allowed, and Lord, we understand the, the wisdom behind this. But we do pray that this would run its course quickly, that very soon we would be together around your table, partaking of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper again. Father, be with our session. We thank you, Lord, for the wisdom you have given to the elders of this congregation. And help us, Lord, as we seek to care for the congregation as well as continuing our ministries and directing uh, the work of this particular body. Lord, bless and use our deacons, we pray. Keep them in your care and help them to be wise in reaching out to the members of the congregation. Lord, help us too to be a great witness to those around us, those who do not know the truth of the gospel. Lord, use Grace Church powerfully in these days for the advancement of your kingdom and the conversion of many to faith in Christ. Lord, you are a great God, and you have ordained these things for your own glory, and we long to see your glory displayed in this world. Lord, this nation and indeed this whole world has become so increasingly secular, it denies that you exist. It denies that you govern and control all things by the word of your power. It denies that you are the creator of this world. Lord, it denies everything about you. And Lord, we do pray that through this crisis, through this hour of global turmoil, many, many hearts would be turned back to you and drawn to saving faith in Christ. Lord, be with our congregation, be with our widows and those who are older, who are especially vulnerable for this kind of disease. We pray that you would guard and protect and keep them from being exposed and infected with this virus. We ask, Lord, that you would be particularly with Lynn and Sandy as they work in the healthcare industry, and as Lynn sees patients and does the work that she is called to do, Lord, use her and protect her, we pray. And Father, we ask too that you would be blessing others, maybe those whose work has slowed down or changed significantly. Lord, give us all patience. We need great patience. Father, we pray too for our presbytery, that you would be with our sister churches around the presbytery of the Midwest. Be with those who are struggling to uh, have their services available for their congregations. We pray that you would give pastors and uh, elders and deacons and church members great wisdom on how to use this technology that's available to us in the best possible way. Father, we pray, too, that our presbytery would soon be able to meet again and conclude the rest of its business for the spring meeting. Lord, you're the one who is in charge of this, and we do pray that you would make that possible for us again. We pray for your servants around the world who are serving on the mission field, Lord, as they face the disruption of this pandemic. We pray that you would guard and protect and keep them, that your hand would be upon them for much good, and that they might be able to do active ministry in these days. So, Lord, we pray that you would do great and mighty things, and that your name would be glorified in all of this. Help us and bless us and use us, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name, 
Amen. At this time, I would invite you to turn in your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. And I will be reading verses 15 through 33. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days at Tirzah. Now the peoples were camped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. The people who were camped heard it said, Zimri has conspired and has also struck down the king. Therefore all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. Then Omri and all Israel went, and all Israel with him went up from Gibbethon and besieged Tirzah. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house with over him with fire and died because of his sins which he had sinned, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin which he did, making Israel sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his conspiracy which he carried out, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts, Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginneth, to make him king. The other half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginneth. And Tibni died, and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. He reigned six years at Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill and named the city which he built Samaria after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted more wickedly than all who were, with, who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sins, which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might, which he showed, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab his son became king in his place. Now Ahab the son of Omri became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa king of Judah, and Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah, Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So far the reading of God's word in 1 Kings. Now if you would please turn to our passage in Acts. We're turning to Acts chapter 8, looking this morning at verses 4 through 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8 Four through eight. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. 
The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, as we look today into your word, give us insight and understanding. Grant us the grace we need to not only believe, but to obey these things. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Though it happened almost 25 years ago, I can still remember my shock and amazement at the scene. I was a young minister working in the PCA. I was doing church planting. And our mother church had a relationship with a particular missionary who would occasionally come for a visit, give a report, and preach for us. And on that particular visit, he had again offered to preach. And the elders were very agreeable. They liked this man. But then they found out that his sermon that morning was going to be something not so good. Well, what exactly did this man plan to preach on? His announced theme was that only ordained ministers could do evangelism. Our elders didn't think that that was such a good idea for a sermon, so they asked him if he could preach on something else. And his alternative proposal was even stranger still. I think it was something about geocentrism, how everything revolves around the earth, not the sun. Well, his original idea that only ordained ministers can and should do evangelism is flatly contradicted by our text here this morning. In fact, every single believer in Christ has a duty to spread the good news of Jesus far and wide as opportunity allows. So this morning, as we look at this passage, I want to first of all consider providential preachers. Then we are going to look at Jerusalem and then finish by considering Samaria. Well, during the days and weeks and months leading up to Stephen's death, the church in Jerusalem had been growing by leaps and bounds. That growth had necessitated the ordination of the first deacons, as we saw back in chapter 6. So by this point, there were the 12 apostles plus the seven deacons who had been set apart. And yet the church was growing exponentially. This happened because average, ordinary Christians, people like you and I, were sharing the good news of Christ with their neighbors, their family, their friends, their co-workers, their associates, the whole group of disciples had become disciple makers. And so they undoubtedly spread the good news of Christ in Jerusalem even before the persecution broke out. On the day of Stephen's death, things changed dramatically for Christians living in Jerusalem. In God's wise and holy providence, they were scattered abroad by persecution. Last week, we saw how they went into all of the regions of Judea and Samaria, all of them except the apostles who remained in Jerusalem. And this flight put them out of reach of Saul's murderous program, at least temporarily. Now, this is really a combination of God-given wisdom 
and God's providential purposes. From the side of those Christians, it only made sense to get away from the danger that was surrounding them by relocating to a safer place, at least temporarily. Jesus himself had counseled his followers to flee in certain circumstances. In Luke chapter 21, he says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. Now, this is all pointing ahead to the war of the Romans against the Jews from 66 A.D. to 70 A.D. And Jesus is telling them, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by the army, so you look out and you see armies, Roman armies, foreign armies, all around the city. When you see that, use your noggin and recognize that Jerusalem's desolation is at hand. And when you see those sights, those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those who are in the midst of the city must leave the city post-haste. And those who are in the country should not enter the city under any circumstances. Why? Because the Romans would besiege that city for three and a half years. And so if you didn't clear out and get away, you would be swept up in the destruction of the Roman army against Jerusalem. And so Jesus tells his followers, keep your eyes open and keep your ears open and watch and think about things that are going on. Don't be foolish. Don't be naive. Go ahead and process and consider and think about these things. And if you need to, leave, flee, run away. There's nothing particularly righteous and holy about standing boldly in the path of destruction so that you can get mowed down by destruction. And that even has some bearing on our current crisis, doesn't it? They're telling us that there are infected people in our area. And if you spend a lot of time going to places where there are a lot of people gathered, well, guess what? There's probably a likelihood you might be exposed to someone who has this virus. Why would you do that? Don't do that. It's not wise to do that. I heard about a YouTuber. I didn't watch this video, but this YouTuber was boldly uh, saying that he could have direct contact with a toilet, and that would be just fine. And then, just recently, he was tested positive for the virus. Don't do stupid things. Don't take unwise risks. Be thoughtful. Be careful. These people who are fleeing away from persecution, who are trying to get out of Saul's reach, they were wise, and God commends such wise activity. But then there's also here a sense of God's purposes that are being accomplished. This is God's sovereign hand at work. He is moving his church out of Judea and Samaria. He is using the persecution to relocate them to those regions that he wanted to be evangelized. Remember, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So you've done a pretty good job in Jerusalem, but now it's time for phases two and three. That's Judea, the surrounding area, in southern Israel, and Samaria, which is in central and northern Israel. Now this is a movement away from the heart and center of Judaism 
to an area or a region that is still mostly mainly Jewish. Judea was a very Jewish area. But when we're talking Samaria, now we're talking cross-cultural. We're going across boundaries in order to reach out to people who are different from us, people with whom we don't exactly have a great relationship. But you see, this was God's purpose. He wanted it to happen. And now he is moving his church into the mission field of Samaria. Well, as these refugees fled, it says that they went about preaching the word. The Greek term that is used here in verse 4 is quite important. It is euangelizo, and it is the word from which we get our English word evangelize. The noun Evangelion means the good news, the gospel. And when Evangelion is put into its verbal form, Evangelizo, it carries the idea of spreading the good news around, of declaring glad tidings, of proclaiming the gospel of peace. Now, this is not the work of the ordained evangelist, but rather the natural, normal action of ordinary Christians, of men and women, just like you, just like me. Sometimes it has been said that this is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And I think that is true. This is the type of everyday evangelism that all Christians are called to practice in the course of normal, ordinary life. As you go, wherever you go, Jesus said, make disciples. All believers have a share and a stake in the accomplishment of the Great Commission it is for ordained officers, yes. It is for ministers like me, but it's also for ordinary people just like you. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have advanced degrees. You don't have to be licensed by the presbytery in order to share the gospel with someone else. And so it is a both and. It's all hands on deck. We all as Christians, need to be sharing the gospel just as these people were. As they went into Judea and Samaria, they went about evangelizing. I think that's really the best uh, translation of this. Now we can deduce something of their message by looking at what Philip was preaching. In verse 5 of our text, it says that Philip came down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming the Christ to them. Philip is preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, it only makes sense that if you're going about spreading the gospel, doing evangelism, sharing the good news, you need to be mainly, mostly talking about Jesus. If you don't tell people that Jesus died to save sinners, well, you know what? You're not really proclaiming the good news of the gospel. There's always pressure to compromise the message, to make it more palatable to the unbeliever, to keep from causing offense on the part of those who are lost and dead in their sins. And so there is always this impulse to pare off some of the sharper corners of the gospel and to make it more user-friendly, as they sometimes say. Don't talk so much about sin. Don't demand repentance. Just tell people that God loves them and wants to make their lives peaceful, and nice. 
But you see, the good news of the gospel centers on and focuses upon Jesus Christ and his life, his death, his resurrection. It is about his cross, about his blood shed for the remission of sins. The gospel is not just a psychological prop so that you can live a better life. The prosperity preachers, Joel Osteen and his ilk, are flat out wrong. The gospel is about Jesus and what he came to do for sinners like me and sinners like you. And so just as Philip preached Christ, these people who were going around were preaching Christ. And so we too must preach Christ if we are really sharing the gospel which is found in the pages of Scripture. So what were the results of their witness? First of all, in Jerusalem. We want to look at Jerusalem as the first city in our tale of two cities. As for Jerusalem, you might say that it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. The apostles were preaching. People were being converted in large numbers. Those newly minted deacons were carrying out vital ministry to the large number of widows. Everything was growing. Everything was vital and vibrant and alive. It was the best of times. And yet... There was growing resistance. The apostles are repeatedly arrested for their activities in the temple. The Sanhedrin is heard forbidding them from speaking or teaching in Jesus' name. Tensions are rising. Persecution is coming. It's the worst of times. And then Stephen comes into the spotlight. As we saw in chapter 6, Stephen was full of grace and power. He was performing great wonders and signs among the people by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some from the synagogue of the freedmen were arguing and disputing against Stephen, but they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. And since they could not beat him fair and square in open debate, they instead resorted to deceitful scheming. They enlisted false witnesses to make ludicrous claims against him. Put under arrest, He was brought before the Sanhedrin to explain and defend himself against these charges, which, by the way, he did in a masterful manner. Despite Stephen's compelling and powerful sermon, the Jewish leaders would not budge. The Sanhedrin became irrational in its anger. They were filled with a malicious rage against him. So they drive him out of the city where they stoned him to death, even, even as he was praying for God's mercy for them, his murderers. And of course, this unleashes Saul of Tarsus to lead an aggressive and violent campaign seeking to eradicate Christianity out of Jerusalem Going from house to house, Paul is arresting, imprisoning, tormenting, and persecuting Christians for being Christians. So what we see happening there in Jerusalem in those days is twofold. First of all, there is a staunch and stout refusal of the Jews in Jerusalem to repent of their heinous sin of murdering the Messiah. They wouldn't even hear such talk. They shut their ears for any and every call to repentance. And then secondly, we see them now proactively persecuting the followers of Christ. 
They compound their sin by now tormenting and terrifying Christian disciples. They won't repent, but they go on the attack instead. And this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. In Luke chapter 21, he says, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. That's exactly what's happening in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus had given his disciples very specific instruction of what to do in such circumstances. Back in Matthew chapter 10, we read, whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. For truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Leave. Shake the dust off your feet as you go in judgment against them. And know for certain that it will be far worse for Jerusalem on the day of judgment than even for Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, why is that the case? Because Jerusalem was the city of the great king. This was the city of David. This is the city where the temple was. This is the heart of Judaism in the first century. These are the people that should have welcomed Jesus with open arms, and yet they could chant, crucify, crucify, crucify. And so these people in Jerusalem, with all of their great privileges, absolutely squandered their glorious opportunity, and they put themselves in the crosshairs of Almighty God, who will send them to hell to suffer worse torments than what the perverts of Sodom and Gomorrah will face. Jerusalem has become a very wretched and miserable city by this point in our story. Our second city is the city of Samaria. Now, some of your translations may not say the city of Samaria, but they might say a city of Samaria. There is a little debate among translators and commentators over the use of the definite article, the, the city of Samaria. And the background information, all the textual information, says there's strong reason to say it should be included, the definite article. This is the city of Samaria. But behind the grammatical squabble, is a bit of history. The historic city of Samaria, which had been built by Omri, as we read in 1 Kings, had fallen into ruin and was rebuilt by Herod the Great and was renamed Sebasta. It's unclear whether the city mentioned here in our text was that city, Sebasta, or another prominent city in the region of Samaria. Well, the point is the same, regardless of which prominent city we're talking about, because there is a whole history and heritage for this region, which really goes back to the founding of the Northern Kingdom. Uh, 
As we read in our Old Testament, the city of Samaria was founded by Omri, that wicked northern king, who is also the father of Ahab, king of Israel. Both Omri and Ahab were pagan to the core. And indeed, the northern kingdom was apostate for almost its whole existence following the religious innovations that Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had introduced. But of course, Ahab took things to a new level. He wasn't content with just the sins of Jeroboam. He introduced his own, whole own system of sinning. The wickedness of the northern kingdom was finally punished in 722 B.C., when the Assyrians came and conquered the northern kingdom. Those whom they did not kill, they led into captivity, most of them never ever to be returned. In place of the Hebrew inhabitants of that region, the Assyrians brought in other conquered peoples from other areas. This was part of their policy. You conquer one area, you move its inhabitants out, you take another conquered people, you transplant them in. And in that way, you keep from having local uprisings that gain much steam. Everybody is essentially living as refugees. And that's what happened. The people who were living in what became known as Samaria were not real, true, blue-blood Jews. At best, they were really a mixed race of compromisers. Derek Thomas characterizes them in his commentary as follows. He says, In the years that followed, the Samaritans were considered as hopeless syncretists, heretics. The Jewish historian Josephus characterized them as pro-Greek, a fact that did not endear them to first century Jews who would recall their oppression under the Greeks. So right up into the New Testament era, the animosity that existed between the Jews and the Samaritans was very strong on both sides. Each side viewed the other with contempt. Jews would not even travel through the region of Samaria if they could possibly help it. And they would not even use a cup or a plate or a utensil that a Samaritan had used. But as we see in passages like John chapter 4, our Lord Jesus was not afraid of the Samaritans. He ministered among them. And in fact, in John 4, a whole town of Samaritans was converted through his preaching ministry. Moreover, Jesus in his teaching typically characterized the Samaritans in a fairly positive way, such as the story of the Good Samaritan. And if you remember that story, there are some Jewish characters who don't come off looking that good, but it's the Samaritan that is kind of the hero of that story. Before Jesus left the earth and ascended into heaven, he instructed his disciples to be witnesses in Samaria, as well as in Judea and Jerusalem. And thus, Philip's ministry in Samaria is in obedience to Christ and his commands. Philip goes to the city of Samaria and begins proclaiming there Christ to them. And as he was preaching the gospel, he was also performing miraculous signs. He was casting out unclean spirits. He was healing the lame and the paralyzed. This is a word and deed ministry, which is much like that of Jesus and the apostles. And just look at how these Samaritans responded. It is stunning, stunning these are Samaritans. As Philip was preaching to them, it says, with one accord, they were paying attention, they were giving attention to what he was saying. 
They weren't staring out into space. They weren't looking at someone else who was sitting there next to them. They were transfixed on what Philip is preaching. They are listening with their ears wide open. And as they experience God's grace, many of them were believing and being baptized. We're going to see that in the later part of this same chapter. So this is a tremendous movement of God's Spirit in Samaria, of all places. And because of the ministry of Philip, and because of the movement of the Holy Spirit, many of these Samaritans were rejoicing. They were filled with joy because they had come to know the salvation of God. Now, in the theology, the kind of aberrant theology of the Samaritans, there was this great expectation that one would come, the Taib, who would be a restorer, a deliverer. And now Philip is proclaiming the restorer, the deliverer, the Messiah had come. They were believing. They rejoiced in that knowledge. And what a deliberate and very sharp contrast this really is. These two cities, Jerusalem and Samaria, they're placed side by side right here in the text for us to consider. We see first Jerusalem where the Jews are murdering Christians, imprisoning them, torturing them, abusing them. And then the scene shifts to Samaria. And here we see God's Spirit at work, people listening intently to the message proclaimed, seeing the signs, believing the good news, being saved from their sins. And I would suggest to you that contrast is very purposefully presented so that we will see how different things are in Samaria as opposed to what had been going on in Jerusalem. And frankly, it's utterly unexpected. Jerusalem was the city of the great king. Jerusalem was the location of the temple. This is where God's throne was. But Jerusalem had gone altogether apostate as it was now cruelly persecuting the followers of Christ. And Samaria, Samaria, that wicked city of ill repute, now Samaria is drinking in gospel ministry, believing with all their hearts in the Lord Jesus Christ. How utterly unexpected things are. You know, our God loves to turn things on their heads. He loves to surprise us, even shock us. And what a spur this is to us to remember that God is in control. Go back three or four weeks. Go back to the beginning of this year. Did you have any idea that at the end of March we would not be allowed to meet for worship in our sanctuary? That we would not be able to take the Lord's Supper on the last Sunday of the month of March? I mean, even back three weeks ago, did you anticipate that? I didn't. I don't think you did either. And yet God surprises us. God does things that we do not anticipate because he is powerful and can do whatever he is pleased to do. And even now we have a sense that God is bringing good out of this and may bring much good out of this. But you know what? We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. We don't know what new thing is going to happen two weeks or ten weeks from now. 
Things could be much, much better. Things could be horribly, horribly worse. What's it going to be? What do we think? Will it be great and grand and glorious? Will it be even more draconian than what we're now experiencing? We don't know. But God is sovereign. He's in control. He is doing all things well. And he can just as easily set aside Jerusalem as he can favor Samaria with his Spirit's blessing. I think this should really spark in us a certain confidence and a commitment to ministry. Things were going bad in Jerusalem, so those believers fled, wisely fled, to Samaria. And there in Samaria, they were going about spreading the good news of Christ. Ministry in the midst of turmoil and chaos. Let me finish this morning with a somewhat longish quote from a commentary by Tony Merida. Some of you have already seen this. I posted it on social media. I thought it was so helpful. But I think it bears consideration and it bears repeating. Tony Merida writes, The early church went about preaching the word wherever believing men and women went. Have you considered that even in your promotions, your demotions, and your setbacks, God has sovereignly ordained and allowed twists and turns in your life to give you opportunity to preach the gospel to your neighbors and acquaintances? The Lord has arranged opportunities for you to share Jesus in word and exemplify that message in deed to your new friends and colleagues. So if you are wrestling with a job loss, or have even had to flee a location because of real physical persecution, it's time to reflect on how God, in his mysterious sovereignty, has permitted your pain. Consider how he might use it as a way for you to teach and testify about God's grace. God is on a big mission, and we're part of it. He's redeeming the world through his Son by the power of the Holy Spirit at work through ordinary people like you and me. This is how the gospel spread so effectively in the first century and why the gospel continues to spread so effectively in the 21st. Indeed, God is sovereignly using COVID-19 to scramble this nation and this world. And as he is sovereignly doing that, It is a time of opportunity for you to bring the comfort and hope of the gospel to those who are lost and need the word of truth. Will you share with someone, maybe even someone this week, that good news about Jesus, who has died to save sinners, and who can care for people no matter what the circumstances they face. If God has displaced you from your ordinary routines, don't be grumpy. Don't sit around complaining and feeling sorry for yourself. Use this as an opportunity to glorify your Lord and to help someone who is needy. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your sovereign ways and how sometimes you bring difficulty into our lives in ways that we simply do not expect. So, O Lord, help us, hear us and help us so that we might live unto you in faithfulness and that we might serve you in this hour of trial and opportunity. Give us opportunities, even in the days ahead, Lord, 
to share the comforting good news of Christ with those who are lost and needy. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn this morning, please turn in your Psalter hymnal to hymn number 421, Christ Shall Have Dominion. And if you would, please stand as we sing together. Hymn 421. And now receive the Lord's blessing. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Amen. <laughs>